Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be doing a quick review of TikTok of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So this is the latest in the series of buddy reads that I've been doing with the one and only Joel Swagman. Uh, at the time of filming this, I'm not even supposed to have started reading it. So I think according to, well, it's the 30th of December now. According to our schedule, we were meant to start this on the 3rd um, of January. But basically I took it home with me over Christmas and then I ran out of books to read on the way home. So this was my backup book and I ended up reading it all in the one journey. Um, we've also gone slightly off schedule because um, Joel's edition, he's got like the complete stories of Oz, even though it's not complete. But what it does include is like a short novella or short story collection or something like that. I'm not entirely sure what it is, uh, but we're gonna be reading that one next. Um, so we were supposed to read that before this one, but I've asked him if we can swap those around because I'm ready <laughs> to do the review. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out my tabs and then I'll share my overall thoughts on rating at the end. So, Dane reads, TikTok of Oz, in which Betsy Bobbin and Hank the Mule are shipwrecked on the coast of Oz, meet up with the invading army of Queen Anne of Oogaboo and help the Shaggy Man rescue his brother from the evil Gnome King. Let's have a little look. We start off with a usual note to my readers. Nothing in it this time I particularly wanted to share with you guys. So we're gonna go straight into chapter one, Anne's army. So we meet Anne, she's called Anne So Forth, which is a great pun. Um, and this is a little bit of characterization here. She's basically the antagonist. Um, well, no, she's not. The Gnome King is the antagonist. It's kind of set up as though Anne So Forth is gonna be the antagonist and then she turns out to be not too bad after all. But she starts out with this plan to conquer Oz with her army. So we get, now, Anne had not forgotten when her birthday came, for that meant a party and feasting and dancing, but she had quite forgotten how many years the birthdays marked. In a land where people live always, this is not considered a cause for regret, so we may justly say that Queen Anne of Oogaboo was old enough to make jelly, and let it go at that. But she didn't make jelly, or do any more of the housework than she could help. She was an ambitious woman, and constantly resented the fact that her kingdom was so tiny, and her people so stupid and unenterprising. Often she wondered what had become of her father and mother, out beyond the pass, in the wonderful land of Oz, and the fact that they did not return to Oogaboo led Anne to suspect that they had found a better place to live. And so this is where she gets her idea to uh, basically try and enslave Oz. Um, so the phrase, old enough to make jelly, I guess in the UK we would say old enough to make jam. Because jelly here is jello. But Jello is the brand name, I think. And how good does this sound? This will appeal to you if you are a reader. We're talking about um, Joe Files. Um, so Queen Anne let Joe Candy have his own way and continued her journey to the house of the 18th and last man in Oogaboo, who was a young fellow named Joe Files. The Files had 12 trees which bore steel files of various sorts, but also he had nine book trees on which grew a choice selection of storybooks. In case you have never seen books growing upon trees, I will explain that those in Joe Files' orchard were enclosed in broad green husks which, when fully ripe, turned to a deep red colour. Then the books were picked and husked and were ready to read. If they were picked too soon, the stories were found to be confused and uninteresting and the spelling bad. However, if allowed to ripen perfectly, the stories were fine reading and the spelling and grammar excellent. You have this little image there. So Files is kind of the one that has the know-how and he wants to be the private in the army because um, that means he gets to shoot people basically. And then we have this awful little thing. So. We've talked, me and Joel, in our reviews recently. I'll link to Joel's channel below and to his review of this book if it's out when, when I schedule this and stuff. But we've talked about, like, throughout the Oz series, there's been, like, this debate over whether Oz people can be killed. It seems to change in every book. Um, and here we have, like, a fate worse than death. Like, this is really grim for a children's story. So... The only picture of a rack that I ever saw in a book was rather blurred, said Files, because the book was not quite ripe when it was picked. But the creature can fly in the air and run like a deer and swim like a fish. Inside its body is a glowing furnace of fire, and the rack breathes in air and breathes out smoke, which darkens the sky for miles around, wherever it goes. It is bigger than a hundred men and feeds on any living thing. The officers now began to groan and to tremble, but Files tried to cheer them up, saying, It may not be a rack after all that we see approaching us, and you must not forget that we people of Oogaboo, which is part of the fairy land of Oz, cannot be killed. Nevertheless, said Captain Buttons, if the rack catches us and chews us up into small pieces and swallows us, what will happen then? Then each small piece will still be alive, declared Files. I cannot see how that would help us, wailed Colonel Banjo. A hamburger steak is a hamburger steak, whether it is alive or not. And, um... <laughs> Files shoots the rack. Here we go. Here is a photo of him shooting the rack. And we get this, this great line. The rack goes, badness me. See what you've done with that dangerous gun of yours. But I just love that expression, badness me. And then Files and the, what is it called? The rack are talking. Um, 
And so we get, pardon me if I now bid you goodbye, he said to the rack. The parting is caused by our desire to continue our journey. If you die, do not blame me, for I was obliged to shoot you as a matter of self-protection. I shall not die, answered the monster, for I bear a charmed life. But I beg you not to leave me. Why not? asked Files. Because my broken jaw will heal in about an hour, and then I shall be able to eat you. My wing will heal in a day, and my leg will heal in a week, when I shall be as well as ever. Having shot me and so caused me all this annoyance, it is only fair and just that you remain here and allow me to eat you as soon as I can open my jaws. I beg to differ with you, returned the soldier firmly. I have made an engagement with Queen Anne of Oogaboo to help her conquer the world, and I cannot break my word for the sake of being eaten by a rack. Oh, that's different, said the monster. If you've an engagement, don't let me detain you. Imagine if Smaug was that polite. So Shaggy Man, of course, has got the love magnet, so we get this little bit here. Come, she whispered, approaching the Shaggy Man and taking his hand. Let's go somewhere else. They'll surely kill us if we stay here. Don't worry, my dear, replied Shaggy, patting the child's head. I'm not afraid of anything so long as I have the love magnet. The love magnet? Why, what is that? asked Betsy. It's a charming little enchantment that wins the heart of everyone who looks upon it, was the reply. The love magnet used to hang over the gateway to the Emerald City in the land of Oz. But when I started on this journey, our beloved ruler, Ozma of Oz, allowed me to take it with me. So he's got the love magnet with him again. Marvellous. And um, they get to like this place where um, basically all the people are made out of flowers and they're growing a new ruler. Um, and we get this casual bit of sexism here, so... While examining these curious growing people, Betsy passed behind a big central bush and at once uttered an exclamation of surprise and pleasure, for there, blooming in perfect colour and shape, stood a royal princess, whose beauty was amazing. Why, she's ripe, cried Betsy, pushing aside some of the broad leaves to observe her more clearly. Well, perhaps so, admitted the gardener, who had come to the girl's side, but she's a girl and so he can't use her for a ruler. No, indeed, came a chorus of soft voices, and looking around, Betsy discovered that all the roses had followed them from the greenhouse and were now grouped before the entrance. You see, explained the gardener, the subjects of Rose Kingdom don't want a girl ruler, they want a king. A king! We want a king! repeated the chorus of roses. Isn't she royal? inquired Shaggy, admiring the lovely princess. Of course, for she grows on a royal bush. This princess is named Ozga, as she is a distant cousin of Ozma of Oz, and, were she but a man, we would joyfully hail her as our ruler. And then our heroes pick her, because fuck the patriarchy. Uh, and they're going to find the underground cavern of Ruggedo, the metal monarch. And uh, there's a little uh, footnote here. The king was formerly named Rocca, but after he drank of the waters of oblivion, he forgot his own name and had to take another. See, that actually works. Like, me and Joel talk a lot about um, the retconning in these books. But actually, as long as there's a good reason for it, the retconning kind of works like that did, you know? And we get this breaking of the, th the fourth wall. So Betsy asks, who knows? And Shaggy Man says, no one knows that except the person who's writing this story. Uh, and then we get uh, Polychrome, the daughter of the rainbow. She shows up. Um, she raises her golden head with tears in her blue eyes. I'm the most miserable girl in the whole world, she sobbed. The others gathered around her. Tell us your troubles, pretty one, urged the princess. I I've lost my bow, wailed Polychrome. Take me, my dear, said Shaggy Man in a sympathetic tone, thinking she meant bow instead of bow. I don't want you, cried Polychrome, stamping her foot imperiously. I want my rainbow. So Shaggy Man thought she meant bow as in the French for beautiful. Um, we get this little um, exchange here, which again, I just think is, it's a nice little bit of pedantism, but um, also, I don't know, it's a bit of a pun as well, I guess. So um, Shaggy Man goes, well, 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 where did you come from and how did you get here? Betsy tried to answer him, for Queen Anne was surly and silent. I can't say exactly where we came from, because I don't know the name of the place, said the girl, but the way we got here was through the hollow tube. Don't call it a hollow tube, please, exclaimed the peculiar person in an irritated tone of voice. If it's a tube, it's sure to be hollow. Why, asked Betsy. Because all tubes are made that way. Yeah, fair enough. So it's just a tube. And uh, here we learn about dragons and the law for Oz with uh, dragons. And I just thought this was cool. Um, it's kind of like the Oz equivalent of the creation myth. The dragon, as you must know, was the first living creature ever made. Therefore, the dragon is the oldest and wisest of living things. By good fortune, the original dragon, who still lives, is a resident of this land and supplies us with wisdom whenever we are in need of it. He is old as the world and remembers everything that has happened since the world was created. Did he ever have any children? inquired the girl. Yes, many of them. Some wandered into other lands where men, not understanding them, made war upon them. But many still reside in this country. None, however, is as wise as the original dragon, for whom we have great respect. 
as he was the first resident here, we wear the emblem of the dragon's head to show that we are the favoured people who alone have the right to inhabit this fairy land, which in beauty almost equals the fairy land of Oz, and in power quite surpasses it. And um, here we get this little bit of conversation here which kind of reflects the magic of the world we live in, which I thought was nice, especially for like a kid's book, you know? Uh, I was afraid you were going to ask me that, replied Shaggy in a sad tone. The reason, my dear, is that the earth is so solid that other solid things can't get through it. But when there's a hole, as there is in this case, we drop right down to the centre of the world. Why don't we stop there, asked Betsy. Because we go so fast that we acquire speed enough to carry us right up to the other end. I don't understand that, and it makes my headache to try to figure it out, she said after some thought. One thing draws us to the centre and another thing pushes us away from it, but... Don't ask me why, please, interrupted the shaggy man. If you can't understand it, let it go at that. Do you understand it, she inquired. All the magic isn't in fairyland, he said gravely. There's lots of magic in all nature, and you may see it as well in the United States, where you and I once lived, as you can here. I never did, she replied. Because you were so used to it all that you didn't realise it was magic. Is anything more wonderful than to see a flower grow and blossom, or to get light out of the electricity in the air? Let me get some sorcery, and I just like this, uh, these are the magic words. Adi, edi, edi, odi, udi, ui, u. Edu, I do, edi, ida, ida, woo. And then we finally get, uh, we meet up with TikTok, kind of near the end, and we also get the dragon, and the dragon says, um, well, the dragon's, um, bound up, and, um, so uh, we get, I have a pretty strong push in my forehead, said Quox, and I believe I can break down that door, even though it's made of solid gold. But you are a prisoner, and the chains that hold you are fastened in some other rooms so that we cannot release you, File said anxiously. Oh, never mind that, returned the dragon. I have remained a prisoner only because I wish to be one. And with this he stepped forward and burst the stout chains as easily as if they had been threads. And so I like how we get this, like all of the different kind of parties all kind of come together all to, to face off against the Gnome King. And um, Betsy says, um, I just thought this was again was an interesting little nod to some real world issues that might be familiar to the sort of children who read these. I once knew a little boy who wanted to catch the measles because all the little boys in his neighbourhood but him had them, and he was really unhappy because he couldn't catch them, try as he would. So I'm pretty certain that the things we want and can't have are not always good for us. Very true. We get the use of the word musingly, which just annoys me. Um, they're talking about why Toto can't talk, which is something we've picked up in previous books. All of the other animals in Oz can talk, but Toto's never been able to. Um, and so Ozma says, do you know why? Why, he's a Kansas dog, so I suppose he's different from these fairy animals, replied Dorothy. Hank isn't a fairy animal, any more than Toto, said Ozma. Yet as soon as he came under the spell of our fairyland, he found he could talk. It was the same way with Belina, the yellow hen, whom you brought here at one time. The same spell has affected Toto, I assure you. But he's a wise little dog, and while he knows everything that is said to him, he prefers not to talk. And um, eventually she manages to get Toto to talk. So um, we get this... Um, Really, Dorothy, said Betsy, he can talk with his bark and his tail just as well as we can. Don't you understand such dog language? Of course I do, replied Dorothy, but Toto's got to be more sociable. See here, sir, she continued, addressing the dog. I've just learned for the first time that you can say words if you want to. Don't you want to, Toto? Woof, said Toto, and that meant no. Not just one word, Toto, to prove you're as good as any other animal in Oz. Woof. Just one word, Toto, and then you may run away. He looked at her steadily a moment. All right, here I go, he said, and darted away as swift as an arrow. So at least we know now that Toto can talk, he just chooses not to. So yeah, TikTok of Oz by L. Frank Baum. I mean, this has one of the similar problems that a lot of the titles of his books have, where the titles only really refer to like what happens in the last quarter of them or so. Um, so TikTok isn't actually in this that much, although he is a great character. Um, but yeah, another enjoyable little romp here. Again, I like the fact there's still this sort of journey to it going on, but I like the fact that all of the characters kind of come together at the end, um, again, to face off against this common en enemy, the Gnome King, and he's a good uh, antagonist as well. So I gave this a week four out of five, but did enjoy it, and I'm looking forward to the next one, which, I mean, I can't remember what it is me and, me and Joel are reading next. Actually, we're reading that short story collection, or whatever it is, novella. Uh, and then after that, I guess we're going to read The Scarecrow of Oz, so we're going to get to see our old friend The Scarecrow. So there we have it, that's what I made of TikTok of Oz by L. Frank Baum. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.